Welcome back to another episode of the Fresh Crits of Melbourne. You are back with your host, Steve Flack, here. And today, we're looking at one of the longest crits in Australia. Well, it's not quite a crit. It's a Melbourne to Warney bike race that took place earlier this year on the 19th of February. Uh, I managed to strap some GoPros onto the bike for the first time me ever doing this race. And I wanted to put some footage together just to show you guys at home um, what it's like to race in what is potentially the oldest bike race in Australia. So my prepar preparation coming into this race was, you know, not too bad. I've been doing some Ks, but for unfortunately picked up uh, the spicy cough a week leading into the race. So I spent the whole week uh, leading up um, just trying to recover. So probably wasn't my absolute best, but that doesn't matter because I wanted to take you guys through a couple of different things about this one. Obviously, we've got no power data because it's almost impossible for me to upload that. Um, but... I'll be talking through everything from Swanee life, um, what it's like for the Swanee to uh, to hand you the bags you saw the clip earlier. We'll be talking through toilet stops. We'll be talking through eating, the chaos, the riding in the bunch. Um, but let's firstly talk a little bit about the Melbourne Warney. Straight from the Fresh Crits archives, I've got some footage of the first Melbourne to Warnable race back in 1885. So it is Australia's oldest one-day race and world's second oldest, only to Liege, Bastogne Liege. Um, as you can see here, the guy's riding into Colac right now. Geez, that guy looks really, really aero. Um, and you can see here Mark O'Brien on the podium after one of his many finishes with the Melbourne to Warnable race. So hopefully that's given you a bit of a, uh, a background of what the Melbourne to Warning is all about. So let's get back to it now. All right, so let's talk a little bit about this race at the current day and age. So here it is, 270 Ks, six and a half hours of moving time. And yeah, it's not flat with, with 1,600 meters of climbing. You can see here it starts in Avalon, ends in the beautiful town of Warnable. And you can see here I've, I've highlighted a couple of the bergs that I had to watch out for in this race in order to stay at the front. So when I had them taped on the bars and when I knew that they were coming up, uh, I would try to move forward in the bunch as well as I could. So when asked for some tips from um, from the, the guys on the gram, I got some really, really good ones. Nick Owen, it's a long race. Thank you very much. Absolute goldmine of information. We had uh, Terrence giving me some ideas through the feed zone, which was really, really helpful with some secret recipes that definitely got me through the race. And even some great tips from the master, Jensen Plowright, saying, again, it is a long race. So I felt like I was adequately prepared so let's discuss a little bit more the intricacies about the race and we take it from there. There's something special about riding on a three-lane freeway like this. And this is the Princess Freeway into Geelong out of Melbourne. And um, when I'm riding on roads like this, uh, I did everything I could to avoid riding on the sides of the roads, effectively in the gutter. Because, you know, when you're riding on public roads like this, that's where the glass, metal, sharp plastic is going to be swept into. And the last thing you want is a puncture in a race like this. Now, I took a saddlebag with me, which is pretty controversial. You can see not many people have them, but you know, I was under the impression that if I did get a puncture, I'm going to be able to throw a bacon strip or a plug into my tubeless tires and hopefully be on my way quicker than if I had to do a normal sort of um, tire change with, uh, with clinches or even with uh, tubulars. Fortunately, nothing like that happened to me, which was a huge relief. And you can see here the green sign coming up on the left-hand side, indicating we're getting closer to the Geelong City. So let's crack on from there. Just wanted to, still on the highway here, but just wanted to drop this clip in here to show you how long the Peloton is. Um, it stretches for about 100 meters. So even if you are, you know, you don't want to be right at the front, you can just slowly fall back into the bunch and um, find some rest, as you can see, number 16, um, having a bit of a banana as he, uh, to keep the nutrition levels up. So this isn't your typical bunch ride on a weekend. No, this is obviously a race, and with that, um, you need to make sure that you're keeping your wits around you. There's always going to be people in differing levels in this race. You've got everyone from NRS, uh, A grade, B grade, and even C grade riders all with you in this bunch. So making sure you know, you're keeping your wits around you, um, that you're not overlapping wheels, you're making sure there's an exit strategy at all times is really, really important um, in order for you to just, to just to finish the race, really. 
because you'll see it too many times that uh, there's always a few riders that did not finish and that's definitely not a place you want to find yourself on the result sheet. So the next clip I'm going to show you, it's a 50 second clip and I'm not going to talk over it because what I want you to um, realize is how loud this race is when there's over 150 riders with you, plus all the team cars, plus the marshals, plus the police. The noise of this peloton is insane. It's not just a um, physically draining experience, but a mental one as well. So I'm going to jump to that clip now. It goes for 50 seconds and um, see how you find it. Well, I'm bloody glad that's over for you guys, but unfortunately, it's definitely not over for the Melbourne Awarney race that we're still in now. So we've just hit the first major climb, and I know that because I've got it not only written on the bars, the, the elevation map, I've also got it printed um, in an Excel kind of document down my stem showing um, when the different bergs are. Um, so, and it's also in my garment as well. So I've got all these different points where I can, um, I know I need to start basically moving up in the race because I know my fitness isn't 100% due to the uh, due to the spicy. So with this in mind, I knew this was coming. I did whatever I could to move up in this race, and then I just wanted to keep a relatively steady power. And you can see around that corner how far the group is in front of me, but I know I've had a look behind me, and I know I'm in really, really good company, so I'm not too stressed about that. Let's have a bit of a look at the 10-minute climb and break down the stats. So we hit this climb after about 45 minutes of riding along the highway and, um, and here we go, we launched straight into it. So initially I had a bit of a spike of up to about 800 watts just to um, as we started to launch up it. The climb itself is, is almost like it's two parts. You can see that because uh, you can climb up and then you hit, uh, you descend and was where we hit 72 kilometers and then it's straight back up into it again. You can see there my heart rate maxing out at 190 beats for me, this is really, really concerning knowing I've still got six hours of riding to go. I'm already maxing out my heart rate and I can almost put my hand down and draw that up purely due to COVID. You can see here Geordie as well struggling over the top of that hill, but safe to say, even if you do fall back in the bunch a little bit, the group generally will sit up and allow you to jump back on and recover, which is exactly what we do here. All right, so we've made it over the first berg and the pace has come off and people are uh, just consuming food, relaxing and starting to um, regain their composure once again. And the problem with that is once that happens, your conscious um, or your concentration rather drifts elsewhere and that's when crashes can happen. And that's what exactly happens in this clip here. We're all riding along at a fairly high speed. When you hear the crash of carbon and the scrape of brake pads, fortunately, I had an exit exit strategy here. I could jump onto the grass, get around the rest of the, the crash and jump back into the mix. So it was unfortunate that actually one of my um, teammates or one of my friends who I ride with, Rob Chiggers, was caught in that. And if you head over to the SBS Melbourne Awarney Cycling, um, Melbourne Awarney race, you can actually see the camera zooms in on poor Chigger's face um, as he's uh, trying to sort him out, sort himself out. For the rest of us, though, we, <laughs> excuse the pun, have to get back on our bike and just continue cracking on uh, and try to grab uh, back onto the peloton who is just being off off the front charging because they don't know what's going on behind. So we form a bit of a pace line here and it's all about just drilling ourselves um, and maybe rotating turns in order to fight back to the front of the group, which you can see just up in the distance. So, you know, in these sorts of moments, looking back, it is really important to kind of remain calm in this situation. It is very easy to let the 
blood run to your legs or to your head or whatever um, and you burn a whole bunch of energy but it is yeah you just need to tell yourself look they're only that far in front um, we'll get there take it easy don't burn matches in order to do that so we picked this one about 53 54 kilometers into the race um, and we're about to enter the feed zone. Now, unfortunately, I didn't have uh, my own camera recording, but my great Swanee, Rick Falconer, was um, was all over camera duties, so you'll be able to get a really good perspective of what it's like entering the feed zone. You can see number 131 here, the Sherwinator, found himself a little bit further back in the group, maybe doing some team duties for Team Hurtbox. Now, I guess this is a really, really good time to talk about what I took on this race. It's also a good time to talk about if you're going to ask someone to be a Swanee, what is required of them. Um, so we'll start, firstly start off with, with what I took on the race. Here's the different Swanee bags that I took for the race. So we'll start off with water. I had three 950ml bottles and three 750ml bottles, which you know I started with one 950, one 750 on the bike. In the 750 mil, that was beta fuel. In the 950, that was water. The reason for the bigger bottles is just in case you miss a stop. Depending on the weather, you probably could go smaller or if you have a team car to drive with you. We'll talk a little bit about gels now. Instead of having individual gels you'd have to rip open during the race, I put them in those little flasks. I'll highlight them here. Um, it's just a lot easier to, to drink eat out of those instead of ripping open gels. Um, so I'd definitely do that for the next time I do it. As for bars... I'd probably go half the amount I've got here. You could probably start the race with a couple of cliff bars, a couple of winer bars and some um, wiggle bars in there whatever, or rice cakes. But yeah, I'd probably go half the amount here. I'll put a little list up with what I took in the description so you can have a bit of a look, get an idea of it. At the end of the day, the plan was to have at least 60 to 80 grams of carbs per hour. All right, well, let's get back to the race. So with 54 Ks in, I knew there was a feed zone coming up. This was um, programmed in my Garmin and I also had it written on my stem. And you can see on the red sign here on the left-hand side, it's going to indicate that the feed zone's in one kilometer. So in Australia, well, with the Melbourne of Warnie, all the feed zones are going to be on the left-hand side. So I made sure to position myself there um, so I didn't have to try to push in or cause any sort of crashes um, trying to move from the right-hand side to the left. Now... Feed zones is a prime opportunity for a crash. So I just made sure I was, you know, closer to the back of the group, meaning that I could avoid and, and give plenty of space to the riders in front in case there was a bit of a crash. Um, but look, let's skip ahead and I'll give you the perspective from uh, the great man, Rick. Here we've got some great footage by Rick um, of what it's like to do the handover for the Swannies. They're all marked in a designated area. Um, if you are the Swannie, I would recommend you wearing something nice and bright. People had massive flags, but you could see from a distance, but I don't know if you want to go that far. But you can get a bit of an idea of the chaos that's involved in, a, in the feed zone like this. So you can see here those NRS guys coming in so hot. And for the rest of the punters right at the back, um, you're just trying to survive. You can see I've just seen Rick put my hand up. Cheers, bud. And uh, from there, I'm throwing the bag over my shoulder and pinning it just so I can jump onto the back of the group as the NRS guys have just sent it straight through the, uh, through the feed zone there. All right, so the next clip, I just wanted to highlight the life of a Swanee. So this person is responsible to keep you fed, keep you hydrated, um, and it is a thankless task. It does require them to drive hundreds of kilometers in one day so make sure you've got a full tank of petrol plenty of tunes plenty of podcasts and um and a fresh battery on your mobile phone because you're going to be doing a lot of driving i definitely recommend practicing with your swanee prior to actually doing it in the race because it can be quite tricky to to grab a bag at high speeds and i definitely Practice by starting at a low speed and then slowly moving up into around, you know, 30 to 35 kilometers an hour. Um, all right, let's have a look at this bag drop here, which I showed in the intro. There's a lot of chaos that happened in this one. So let's uh, see if we can break it down. So this feed zone was uh, located at around uh, kilometer 132, so about just over three hours of riding. And you can see the pace is a lot slower. Now I had a look at the stats and came in at this one just at 30 k's an hour, so definitely one of the slower ones. However, the issue happens here when the Stitch and Dart guy misses his bag. I came in real slow and came in way too close trying to dodge a bag right in the middle of where I was. Fortunately, I was able to grab it, get back on the bike and uh, continue riding on, but yeah. Definitely a stressful one, that one. 
All right, so one of the things I do get asked about a little bit in the Melbourne to Warney is how do you manage toilet breaks and nature stops and that sort of thing? Well, yeah, it's a pretty stressful moment in the Melbourne to Warney. It's not something I've ever experienced before, but after some good advice, uh, what I was told is to wait for some of the bigger teams to stop. So the likes of Oliver's, and, and in fact, I waited for Inform. They were the, one of the biggest groups in, uh, that were in this race. So I waited for a few of those guys to pull over. Um, I then pulled over with them, had it ready to go, I guess. Um, and then as I started to see a few of the NRS riders getting back on their bike, I had to snip it a little bit early and, um, and get back on the bike to join the race. Now, the number one thing in this is just not to panic because you can generally leave it up to those guys to carry you back on. And you're not actually racing back to the Peloton, you're just racing back to the convoy. And that's exactly where we are now is we've made it to the convoy. So we duck in between the cars and uh, keep making sure we're staying out of the wind and, and keeping relaxed. And I think that's the number one thing from this is not stressing out too much, not burning any matches um, because there's definitely no need to. You see the rider from Bridge Lane getting uh, some nutrition, getting some bottles and then he'll head back to the front of the race and resume driving the pace. But yeah, number one tips here would be make sure you don't get stage fright, um, relax and pick the right team to, to stop with. This was just a random point of the race, uh, I think maybe 100 k's in, where the group sat up. I believe there was a break that had just finally gone up the road and it was just non-stop surging up until this moment. So I took this time to, to turn the GoPro on and just ride up the side of the race just to give you guys at home a bit of an idea of how big the peloton actually is. You can see all the different teams all lined up next to each other. Right now, I'm probably only pushing you know, 250 watts, we're just slowly tapping the pedals away. Um, and it was one of the most relaxing points of the race. It was uh, beautiful skies, you can see here. Um, that's Mark O'Brien in the front there. Um, yeah, it was a, such an incredible experience and it's just really nice looking back and, and just taking um, taking those little moments of the race to, to look up and check out the surroundings because you rarely get those moments during the race to do that. Okay, so we're going to pick this one up with 120 kilometers into the race, still 140 k's to go in this absolute mammoth Melbourne to Warney. You can see we've got the uh, bright and colorful Lee Turner, who's always in good position with his stitch and dart kit, with his friend Lewis, just up the road a touch, um, helping him find some really good wheels to jump on. Um, so we're coming into a hill climb, and I know that because, like I said before, I've got it on the bars, I've got it on my stem, and also my Garmin's beeping to let me know that there is a climb coming. So I'm doing my best to try to pick the right wheels to move myself up into this race. You're going to see on the left-hand side right now, the hill climb starts here. So for those guys that are wanting to contest the sprint, uh, they're going to want to move up now. Is Lee Turner's found himself right in the gutter here, and he gets really pushed quite wide and gets a little bit grumpy. Grumpy, but unfortunately, there's no one really to get grumpy out there. He's kind of found himself in a little bit of a dodgy position. But the, the, the dangerous thing about that is you can be pushed into the gutter and maybe find yourself with a puncher or even off your bike as you've it's a bit of a drop off there as you come into the gutter. So, you know, it's just one of those things. It's not only just positioning to the front and to the back of the bike race, but like I said before early in this video, positioning yourself across the road so that you are not riding in the gutter all the time and you have a really nice exit strategy. What we might do now is I'll bring up some of the, the data of this climb. We'll put it up here. All right, so here's the data for the climb. Like I said, it's just under 100, 120 kilometers into this race. It's only a short climb at around four minutes, although it does undulate and pipe back up once the uh, main part of the climb is finished. But you're going to be having to push 376 average watts here just to stay with the bunch. Now, that might be all well and good if you want to go to an effort up two bays. Um, but once you're this deep into a race already, the legs are already starting to pinch and um, and things are starting to hurt a lot more than it would normally be. Here we've got 401. We've got Geordie, who's been a bit of a regular here on the Fresh Crits video. Good on you, Geordie. Good to see you out there. Um, but yeah, he's just another another one of those things in the race that you've got to prepare for. If you are going to be doing some training coming into the warning, it can't just be all beach road, um, beach road stuff. You have to throw in a few hill climbs in there. One thing I do want to point out is see this guy in 134 with the double parachute off the back. 
One thing coming into the warning race is it's smart to bring a couple of extra pins in your kit bag so you can really get those numbers pinned nice and close to your body like uh, the Oliver's Rider number 55. Um, no parachuting going on there. So the THB Rider's losing some valuable watts as he's got the double parachute launched, ready to go. Okay, you can see the hill climbs finish sign. Just We just passed it then. Um, and now the guys are going to be looking to descend the hill. And this is where you can actually be found yourself a little bit caught out because you've been sending it and using all those matches, keeping with the group to get up the, um, up the climb. And by doing that, you've probably dropped a few positions back in the peloton if you're not the strongest climber out there or if you're, fatig or if you're fatigued or anything like that. So it's really, really important now that you keep in the wheels and you keep on the pedals and keep that chain tight because the last thing you want to do here is miss a wheel, miss a ride and find yourself having to really scramble to get back um, into the main peloton. So you're going to get a glimpse here of the actual gap that's opened up in front of us. You can see it there. It's only a few bike lengths. There's nothing to be alarmed about, but it's really, really important that you're working together with the team to try to keep the uh, keep the pace and keep the momentum going. You see Jordy there flip the elbow. I gave him a shout out that it was just me and I, I need him to keep pushing through because I'm pretty gassed at the moment here. But there are lots of other teams behind us willing to help chip in and, um, and help pull themselves across. Obviously, in this sort of situation, there's no real need to be alarmed or anything like that because there's a whole bunch of team cars to, to help you drag yourself back. But it's just one of those things to be mindful of as you are heading up those hills, making sure you're getting in those right positions. So if you are not the strongest climber, you're able to fall back a few positions and not let yourself get dropped, which is the last thing you want when you're in a big race like this. But no stress, managed to get back onto the back of the bunch and um, now it's all about finding that recovery and, um, and keeping on the nutrition. Okay, so we're going to pick this one up 155-ish Ks into this race. And if you've missed a toilet stop before, maybe don't be like this guy or maybe you've got the coordination to do it, number 61, which is manages to do a toilet break whilst on the bike. Now, I'm not too sure how he would have pulled out of that fully unscathed, but um, yeah. You do you, mate. You do you. But look, this is one of the most beautiful parts of we've come out of Colac. We're heading into Tamboon. And, you know, when we're coming down into speeds like this of around 70 to 80 kilometers an hour, it's really, really important to keep your wits about you. There's a lot of communication throughout the peloton that we are coming into a corner here, hence why a few of us have grabbed the anchors a little bit. Just to be nice and safe, the last thing you want to do is have a slam um, at 70 k's an hour. So we've been riding in a straight line for a long time. Now we found ourselves coming into a corner. Really important we don't undercut anybody, keeping nice, easy, smooth lines as we come through here. Everyone being really, really safe because the last thing, like I said, you want to do is, is have a slam. So nice and easy. Just wanted to show you guys this one. Um, maybe about what to do or, or rather what not to do when you're on the bike when there's people behind you, but that's up to you. Um, I will skip ahead and have a look at other parts of the race. All right, so we're going to pick this one up at hundred about 180 Ks, and I'm going to stand up, put my hand up and say I didn't read the, the, the race booklet, but I was not expecting any gravel at the Melbourne to warn you. So it was, came as a bit of a nice surprise because I do like riding gravel um, and that sort of stuff. But um, what's happened in the situation here is there's been a climb maybe a kilometer before this and I found myself dropped. I just couldn't go with the front group. A split happened in front of me and all of a sudden the main peloton is shot off the front and it's been left with about 20 to 30 guys from various teams, um, some NRS riders, some just full punters like myself who have been forced to have to work together in order to catch back onto the group. Now, we're having to work up a pretty uh, little a little incline, but after your legs have seen over 180 Ks, um, it's safe to say that they're not like they once were. So we're really, really struggling just to get over this last little pinch, but I'm forcing my body to get over the top. COVID right now is having a huge effect on me because my heart rate's maxed out at 192 beats a minute, but I'm just pushing my body 110% just to stay with these group alone. I know if I'm in a group with Lee Turner and his teammates, they're going to be um, a really good bunch of people to, to keep motivating the group, to keep driving forward. One of the good things is we hear 
is one of the race directors here is actually saying, look, you're not too far off the bunch. Let's keep working. Let's keep pushing because you're not too far off. Because remember, you're not looking to catch the bunch of riders. You're looking to catch the team cars that are that are about 100 to 200 meters back from the peloton. They're the ones you're looking to catch because once you can catch one team car, you can generally leapfrog your way through all the way back to the main peloton. And that's all we're, that we're really looking to do here. So what I might do is I might fast forward this clip to show how the group works together um, and how we get towed back. All right, so now that we've gone into warp speed, uh, it's, I guess, a really good time to talk around how to ride on gravel for those who haven't done too much of it, I guess. There's no better way than to um, learn how to ride on gravel than practice riding on gravel. Go find your, your local fire roads and practice there. Obviously, we're running uh, 25 mil, well, I'm running 25 mil tires, tubeless at about 70-ish PSI. Uh, it's just really important to stay light on the pedals. Um, keep your weight centered over your bike. If you're letting your, your bum take all the hits, that's a good recipe for a, uh, a rear wheel puncture on the gravel. So you can see here, I'm hardly doing any work. And to be honest, I've spoken to the guys in the role being like, I'm cooked, I can't I can't work. I'm really, really seeing the effects of, uh, of COVID. Um, but they're working really, really well. It's just constantly one person sits on the front, drives the pace, flicks the elbow, classic track turns as we kind of slowly work our way back. Little do we know, well, in fact, we do know a, a few of the different team cars have told us that there's actually uh, the Peloton has sat up a little bit. Um, or it might be toilet stops or it might just be um, feeding from the cars, whatever it might be. The group, the Peloton has sat, sat up and... Um, which is almost perfect timing for us to uh, to slowly drive the pace and and get back onto the to the back of the peloton where we can sit up, relax, get some nutrition, get some gels and bars back into our bodies and prepare ourselves for the next eighty ish k's of riding. Um, little do we know, crosswinds. We're heading down to the coast, so crosswinds are going to start playing a bit of a factor into this race. So we'll skip ahead and have a look at that. So after that huge effort off the gravel, jumping in between the team cars, we finally made it back um, into the bunch here. And seeing this view of the Great Ocean Road and the Southern Ocean, um, I remember getting pretty choked up and a little bit emotional on the race, knowing that, you know, we're 200 Ks into this race. And with only, you know, 70 Ks left, we're in a really, really good position to, um, to, to finish. Um, you can see a few guys are still riding around with their Mazette bags. Now, um, I actually missed a feed zone here. Uh, there was a bit of a mix-up with Rick and I. Um, there's a road closure. There was an ambulance, and there was a whole big drama. So, um, missed a feed zone, but fortunately had, you know, those 950 mil and the 750 mil bottles on me. So, I was pretty good for water and as well had enough bars and everything. But look, even if you were... Um, short on water, it's pretty, yeah, you're going to be fine if you generally ask a rider near you to see if you can have a squirt of their water, but it's obviously better to have it uh, on your own. Now, oh, absolutely, some of these numbers are in absolute pieces. Um, so yeah, we've made it to the coast and, and if you're not aware, the closer you are to water, generally the windier it is. And now since we're coming into about five hours of riding, um, it works out to be about one o'clock, give or take. Um, and that's generally when the sea breeze is starting to kick in. So, and that's exactly what we're getting here. We're getting the southerly started to come in and it's going to start providing a little bit of chaos because of the crosswinds. And all that needs to happen is the front group to start riding everyone into the gutter. And then there's less and less of a draft for the riders behind. And eventually people get gutted and get dropped. So I guess the question is, what do you do to try to avoid this? Um, well, it is quite hard, you know, you have to try to position yourself further up into the race, but, you know, often when your legs are absolutely cooked after 200 Ks, it is quite hard to do that. So uh, trying to find the, not, the right wheels that aren't surging and that sort of thing is really, really important when you get into the crosswinds like this. You can see here the pace has started to ease up a little bit. You can tell because the bunches, uh, the group has bunched up and I've found myself right in the middle of the bike race as we cross over the bridge into Petersburg along the beautiful Great Ocean Road. Right now would be an ideal time to start moving up closer and closer in the race. But obviously, you know, 
Um, it's all well and good to look back at this afterwards and, and sort of um, suggest those things. But at the time, you just want, you're just looking at the wheel in front of you. Well, this is how I felt. I'm just looking at the wheel in front of me and telling myself to keep turning the pedals over. Um, at this stage of the race, both legs are cramping up. Um, as soon as I get out of the saddle, legs are absolutely cramping. Um, and then often I'll have to unclip just to straighten my leg out just to avoid the cramp from seizing totally up the uh, up the leg and being able to pedal. So, yeah, it's safe to say I'm absolutely in all sorts. Um, I am not one that ever really gets cramps. So moving in, if I was to do the root warning again, maybe get on the pickle juice or, or look at my nutrition strategies a little bit more closely to avoid something like that happening again because... It was absolutely brutal. All right, so I think I've got this pinned to about kilometer 220, 221, where we make a left-hand turn. And um, the direction we were riding before, we had the wind almost at our backs, if it's blowing us subtly or subtly south-southwest. Um, and now we've turned that left-hand corner, and all of a sudden, the wind is now coming from a bit more of a cross or, or a cross tailwind, maybe even a little bit. And the interesting thing about this is now all of a sudden you can see the entire group buried in the right-hand gutter, not really getting any sort of benefit or draft from the riders in front of you. Now, if the brain was functioning at 100%, which it definitely wasn't, this would have been a really good time or even before this when we're in that tailwind sector. And even now as everything starts to bunch up is to really do whatever I possibly can to make myself get as far up the road as I possibly could um, so I don't get gutted. And what I mean by being gutted is effectively if the wind, as an example, is coming in the direction where I've got that arrow, you want to be hiding to, for example, on number 34, to his right hip in order to get the best draft from that rider. Now, when the wind is blowing that direction, you don't want to be sitting behind them because you're not getting protected, but sitting just to the right of them uh, is where the best draft's going to be. But when you get gutted, that means the entire peloton moves to the right-hand side. You can't go any further right, otherwise you're going to be in the grass, and that's exactly what happens in a moment. As you can see there in that very quick sped up clip, um, more and more riders are going out the back door and right now this is where it all breaks apart for me. A surge up the road um, creates a split um, and I'm hoping this guy in the blue helmet can um, can tow back on but he's also feeling the absolute burn and it's, this is where you see the difference between myself as a BA grade rider and the NRS guys is they've got the punch to, to get themselves back into the mix after about five hours and 220 kilometers, uh, it's safe to say, I'm absolutely done. So what happens now? There's been a break, or there's a split rather. Um, I'm looking behind me to see if there's anyone that wants to roll through. Unfortunately, we've got um, Andrew Kennelly in, up the road on in the blue kit at the front of this little two-piece. And uh, on my left, there's Josh Davis, who's, uh, who's A-grade rider. So I've actually ridden a fair bit with um, Andrew before at the crits down here in Melbourne and he's a bloody strong rider and he can just, he's a bit of a diesel and just can keep pushing the watts all day. Now, if to give you a bit of an idea of how hard we're actually going here, I've once again pulled up the Strava stats. So for the initial sort of before I got dropped, I was able to force out a measle, measly 600 watts, but... In terms of just the driving or the riding that we're doing now, I think we're averaging anywhere between 200 to 250 watts and our heart rate's basically pushing at a threshold effort. So that just shows you the fatigue that the body is actually under um, when it's this deep into the race. So you saw a few of the cars with um, driving past there, jumping back onto the convoy. We're desperately wanting to get some draft from the cars, but obviously they're coming through too quickly and uh, none of us have the energy to sprint up to a speed that's fast enough to jump onto a car like Bridge Lane or, or Inform. So this leaves us with basically two really real options here, is we can continue tapping out a nice tempo pace, which we're trying to do now and, and try to force our bodies to consume more uh, carbohydrates, or it's sit up and wait for the groups behind to, to catch up where you can ride in with them now. 
we are really the group of the three of us here are caught right in the middle of the peloton which is far up the road and you can actually still make them out make out the convoy so there's a little bit of hope there for us um but when there's only three three riders left here then look it, the chances are really really slim of being able to catch them so what I just decided to do is just try to keep out an easy tempo, uh, make sure we're working for each other. So what you can see here, um, we've got Maddie in the left gutter, which means I can just sit to his right hip and still catch a draft. And that's the sort of co communication that you need to have uh, when you're in a small breakaway like this. Lots of positive communications just to keep the spirits up. We're so close to the finish with only 30 Ks to go. So we've just got to make it there um, without completely blowing up. So it's just the three of us um, riding here for the next um, 20 odd kilometers. Um, and you can see here like where I'm absolutely done. Put a fork in me. I can't feel my legs. It's cramp everywhere. I'm in agony. COVID's finally got me. And um, I've never been in this much pain as I've ever been before. As you see an inform rider just tapping away behind the uh, behind the car there like it's nothing. Um I'm in all sorts. I've basically turned myself inside out to get here and this is it. The race is done for us. Now, For it's not actually over. We still want to make the time cut and that's our, that's our main goal and the time cut's an hour after the first rider has finished. Um, so that's our goal here to just keep tapping out a nice, easy rhythm that we can maintain for the next 30-odd kilometers which is exactly what we do until we're caught up with a few other boys and now we are coming into Warnable and I look to be honest I get pretty emotional in this in this part of the race because it's just been so long and so draining and you've turned yourself inside out and you see on the side of the road you're getting claps from spectators and I'm just really really excited to see Rick and Dave and a few other guys um just to celebrate me completing this race so I'm uh yeah, getting a little bit teary-eyed here because um, I've never, you know, pushed myself this deep and, and done anything this hard before. But um, for those that are watching this and looking to do it next year or in future years, I can't recommend it enough. It is one of the most incredible experiences you'll ever, you'll ever achieve, I feel. Um, once the race is finished, I promise myself to never do the warning again. Um, but as few days go by, you start thinking how great it actually was and reminiscing and looking back at the footage here and all that sort of stuff um, makes you really understand why people keep coming back um, and doing this absolute epic race. So, And it makes it so much better knowing that you are riding with all these guys whose main goal is just to finish. And there are a few stages um, right at the back of the race here where I'm riding with Lewis and... He sees I'm starting to fatigue getting up some of the hills, so he just gives me a gentle nudge to get over the top. So we crack on and finally take the left-hand turn onto Raglan Parade, and this is the finish straight. So this is where Jensen launched his um, massive attack to, to, to win the race back in 2021, and for Cameron Scott to take out the win this year with uh, after 6 hours, 7 minutes, and 41 seconds. So... Look, there's a bit of banter in the group here. We're deciding who's going to uh, lead out the sprint and all that kind of stuff. And I just want zero part of it. I just want to cross that line. Um, and I know I'm so close. So it's uh, yeah, it's such a surreal moment, this part of the race. So with that, I guess as we are coming to the final stage of this race, and unfortunately the, the GoPro dies just before I finish crossing the line, um, I just want to thank a few people really quickly. Obviously, Rick, my Swanee, for um, doing Swanee duties the entire way. Um, GT, R33, C13, all the crew for coming down and supporting me um, for the race. Thank you all for your help. Um, and to you guys at home, thanks for watching. Uh, I hope you got a little bit out of this. And if you did, send me a comment. Um, a like's always good. Subscribe, tell your friends and... Hopefully I'll see you guys at the next race or maybe at the next Melbourne Awarnie. Cheers. Beetroot, Bob and Berries. I ate a rainbow, yes I did. It was colorful and it tasted good.
Nectarine cannabis. 